Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be joining with you today. I hope that you're enjoying your morning so far. Today, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Ecclesiastes called Finding Meaning in a Messed Up World. Now, a great quote, which I love, describes Ecclesiastes as the only book of the Bible written on a Monday morning. Now, I don't know about you, but in these strange times, I struggle to even remember that it is a Monday morning. The changes that we've all experienced may have caused you to step back and think about what's important in life. To consider, does my life have meaning? Is there meaning to what I do with my days, to the things that I've been working for, to the things that I have achieved? By reading Ecclesiastes, we get to benefit from the experience of someone who's done an exhaustive search for meaning. The author who identifies himself as the teacher has experienced all the pleasures, accomplishments and wealth that this world has to offer. But his assessment is that it is all meaningless. Now, the actor Jim Carrey came to a similar conclusion. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it's not the answer. Now, as we read on, as we continue in the book of Ecclesiastes, you may be thinking, I know what comes next. The Bible's going to give us that cliche conclusion. It's going to tell us that the way to find meaning is to become a religious person. We're going to have to be told to clean up our act, follow the rules and be respected by others. However, this too, the teacher describes as meaningless. So as we go through our passage today, we will find that meaning is only found in something greater than ourselves. So our passage this week is in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we're going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 7. So I'd encourage you to to read along with me as, as we start on this. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. A dream comes when there are many cares and many words mark the speech of a fool. A fool. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfil it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfil your vow. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfil it. Do not let let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. So in our passage, the teacher describes how religion is meaningless. Now, Tim Keller defines religion as a set of rules, rituals or actions that enable an individual to earn salvation or favour with God. Now, we know that the book of James talks about religion in the sense of the word that pleases God. However, here we're talking about religious activity done to earn God's favour and blessing. So these are actions done in our own strength to increase our moral standing. So in our passage, there are three ways in which the teacher exposes the failure of religion to provide meaning to our lives. Now, the first of these is found back in verse one. It says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. Now, the house of God referred to is the temple, which was the centre of the Israelites' worship. Now, this was the holy place where God's presence dwelt. The Bible teaches that sinful man cannot come near to a holy God. In fact, as you read the Old Testament, you find it's downright dangerous for man to come in to God's holy presence. But God in his mercy initiated the sacrificial system. 
And these sacrifices enabled the Israelites to live in relationship with a holy God. These were set rules given for how sacrifices were to be made. And these rules laid down uh, a structure for the Israelites' worship. But the thing about this and the danger that the prophets warned against was that these could be turned into a formal ritual. God's intention was for the sacrifices to be made with repentance and faith. However, at times, the Israelites failed to do this. They thought that their sacrifices alone would cancel out their sins. They were going through the motions, simply following a religious ritual. But there was no power in the ritual alone. They failed to put their trust in the God who had mercifully made forgiveness possible for them. And this is what verse 1 refers to as the sacrifice of fools. But the thing is, our hearts can so easily fall into this trap. We can follow set rituals, thinking being a Christian is about showing up on a Sunday, attending meetings. Have you slipped into going through the motions? Do you need to come back to your first love? Come back to that first love you had when you first knew Jesus. Or perhaps you've reduced Christianity to a set of rules to earn God's acceptance and keep him happy. But this too is meaningless. Tim Keller sums up the contrast between religion and the gospel. Religion says I obey, therefore I'm accepted. But he says the gospel says I'm accepted, therefore I obey. God is after your heart. He desires something so much more than empty rituals, but he delights in your faith in him. The gospel brings us the life changing truth that Jesus has paid the price in full. We can add nothing to, we can take nothing away from his sacrifice. It is the obedience of Jesus that means we are accepted in him. He is the vine and we are the branches. He is the giver of life. Therefore, we come near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. So that's the first way that the, uh, the teacher exposes the meaninglessness of religion. The second way is found in verse two, where he tells us, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. Now, this instruction mirrors the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter six, where he teaches us how to pray. Jesus told his disciples not to be like the hypocrites who love to pray in public places. And Jesus told a parable, a story uh, which really illustrated this kind of hypocrisy. Jesus told the story of two men who went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a despised tax collector. Now the Pharisee's prayer style was to pray as loudly as possible. He wanted everybody to hear what he had to say. And he prayed this, it is uh, a remarkable prayer in many ways. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Now, we may not be that blatant. We're probably a bit more subtle, but our hearts can be just the same. We might put our religious merit on display so everybody knows how impressive we are. Do you compare yourself to others to feel better about yourself? It's easily done. But this too is meaningless religion. It's religion that values other people's opinion more than God's. Now, if we go back to Jesus's parable, we find uh, next, Jesus tells us, he lets us in to a glimpse of how the tax collector prayed. He prayed with God at the centre. Jesus tells us he would not even look up to heaven. And he prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A God-centred prayer. 
Verse 7 of our passage tells us, many words are meaningless, therefore fear God. God is holy. He's the only one whose opinion matters. Verse 2 tells us that God is in heaven and we are on earth. He is holy and glorious. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes uses the phrase under the sun quite a lot. You might have noticed that. But it's so important because it's used to describe the meaninglessness of life lived simply under the sun. A life lived just from a human perspective, uh, not considering what might be uh, above the sun, not considering the God who is in heaven. So let's remember the one who is above the sun. Let us remember God who is in heaven. When we lift our eyes to the glory of God, we find meaning and purpose for our life. Meaning cannot be found in our own reputation and accomplishments. It can only be found in the one who is glorious, transcendent, everlasting and holy. And this meaning is found in our Father in heaven. So as the teacher tells us, therefore, we can let our words be few. Jesus tells us our prayers are not heard because of our impressive words. That's good news. They are heard because of who our father is. Our faith has meaning and beauty because it's a relationship with our father. And this relationship is not earned. It's not deserved. Instead, it is a relationship initiated by him. Galatians tells us God sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Your life has infinite meaning and value. God gave his son so that you could be his child. So when you're tempted to look for meaning in other people's opinion, remember you are God's child, loved beyond measure. This is how God showed his love amongst us, that we might be called children of God. What a love. God so wants us to know that father love for us. He so wants our hearts to be able to experience the joy of knowing that he loves us, that he cares for us so deeply as a father cares for their child. Now, as we go on in our passage, we find a third way uh, that the teacher exposes the meaninglessness of religion. And that's found in verse verse four. Here it talks about how a vow made to God should be fulfilled without delay. Now, vows were pledges worshippers would make to God as part of the sacrificial system. The vow was made so that God would answer a specific prayer request. It was a promise made to God to gain his blessing. Now, an example in the Bible uh, was a lady called Hannah. And Hannah did not have a child at that point. But her prayer was that God would give her a child. She desperately was seeking a child. And she vowed that if God gave her one, then she would offer him in service to God. So therefore, when God blessed her with her son, Samuel, she took him to serve at the tabernacle. She offered him in service to God. However, the thing about vows is that they could be costly. We've seen that with Hannah. And people would often try and get out of fulfilling them. So people would make promises to God, which they would not keep. Now, even today, uh, I don't know if you've heard people do this kind of thing. Uh, People often in a crisis will make a promise or a vow to God. You know, God, if you do this for me, then I promise I'll give you this in return. If you give me this job, then then I'll really serve you. If you get me out of this mess, then I promise to give my wealth to you. These are promises that can be made rashly with no true intention to fulfil them. This too is meaningless religion. It is an attempt to manipulate God to give us what we want. Now, verse five in our passage tells us that it's better to not make a vow at all 
than to make one and not fulfil it. And the book of 1 Samuel really helps to highlight this. It says to obey is better than sacrifice and to pay attention is better than the fat of rams. Now the word obey there in that passage can be translated as listen. So we find that worship is listening and obeying God. Now part of the sacrificial process was the priest reading from God's law and then explaining it to the people. Daniel Aiken commenting on this process concludes therefore, revelation is key to Christian worship. The God of the universe wants us to worship him for who he is and what he has done. We need to see God for who he is. We cannot manipulate him or use him for our own purpose. We can't please his heart with empty religion. He takes no pleasure in rituals and he's not moved by efforts to earn his favour. As we've seen, God is in heaven and we are on earth. He is holy and glorious. And therefore, the teacher concludes that we should fear God. Verse 7 concludes, fear God. The only way we can possibly approach a holy God, a God who needs to be feared and honoured, the only way we can come before him is through Jesus. Hebrews tells us that the sacrificial system was a shadow pointing us to the perfect sacrifice of Jesus that was to come. Hebrews 10 says that when Christ came into this world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then Jesus said, here I am. I have come to do your will. Jesus is the true and perfect sacrifice. The old sacrificial system was given by God in his mercy, but it was a temporary system because it could never fully cleanse us of our sins. However, the good news is that the death of Jesus was a once and for all sacrifice for sin. So under the old system, day after day, the priests had to stand to make sacrifices for the sins of the people. Again and again, they would stand up to offer sacrifices. However, after Jesus gave his life on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sat down because his work of redemption was finished. He is now seated forever in glory because the perfect sacrifice has been made. It will never have to be repeated and it can never be improved upon. He has done it. That's why Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. So back to Hebrews, it tells us that by that one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So the blood of Jesus is enough for every sin, both now and for all time. It is made a way for us to confidently enter God's presence, to come into the presence of a holy God. And it's opened up for us a life of meaning and purpose. No greater meaning could possibly be given to your life. God gave his son so that you could be his child. So the way to deal with the meaninglessness of life under the sun is not to turn to empty religion or to look to earn God's favour or blessing. True meaning can only be found by lifting our eyes up above the sun, fixing our eyes on our great high priest, looking to Jesus, the one seated on his throne in glory. We've got to look to him. Let's lift our eyes to the throne of grace. Let's lift our eyes to Jesus, the one who gave it all for us. Let's fix our eyes on him. So I'll finish with this. Uh, and it's the words of just an incredible hymn. Um, from, and it's from before the throne of God above. 
When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. I'll pray. Jesus, we thank you that we can lift our eyes to you. We thank you that our eyes need not be fixed on ourselves, that we need not find meaning through the things that we can achieve, through the things that we can accomplish through our own moral accomplishments. Lord, we know that we have fallen far short, but we thank you that when we lift our eyes to the throne of grace, we find hope. We find meaning, we find life and life in all its fullness. Thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us trapped and bound by sin, but you have freed us that we could come to you, to come to know you and enjoy you forever, to come before you as your children. We thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for giving that most precious gift of your son that we might enjoy you forever. We love you and we worship you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been good to be with you today. Enjoy the rest of your days.